Good morning, and thanks for coming out on the third day of the show. Our feet are sore, but our minds are exhilarated, and everything that we've seen at uh, Modex this year. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to talk about how we see robots, and particularly robot arms, performing more and more tasks in the warehouse. Uh, I'm Eric Neves, I'm the founder of Plus One Robotics. We are a effectively 3D vision solutions company for robots in the warehouse. And uh, I think it's important that we level set on, you know, are the robots in fact coming or not? Uh, and you know even intuitively that in fact they are. Uh, just in 2020 was the first year that robots sold outside of the automotive space were more than robots within the automotive space. And that was sort of a landmark in you know, the history of industrial automation. Uh, 2021 saw that accelerate even further. So there are now more robots by a you know, fair stretch that are finding their way into applications in warehouse and supply chain uh, applications uh, regularly. Um, so, this is how an industrial roboticist sort of thinks about supply chain uh, applications, right? We think of the goods coming in and there's some set of tasks that involve parcels being torn down and, you know, made into eaches that are then sorted and stowed at which point an order comes in and you sort of reverse the process and you pull the items off of shelf, you fulfill the order, you'll you know, pack the shippable, the carton, whatever it is, uh, and then you know, it then becomes sort of a sortation project, right? We have to route those parcels, those parcels then get sent to the courier, the courier then takes and uh, sorts them probably a couple of times, they get loaded, unloaded, there's a lot of manual steps along the way between the time you hit click and the time it shows up at your you know, porch a day or two later. Um, so as we look at the applications, they sort of divide themselves into dealing with the items themselves, the eaches, and then on the other hand, dealing with the parcels, the eaches inside their packaging. And in fact, the process starts with parcels converts to each is in the middle, becomes parcels again, and that's what you end up with. You, when you, you know, reach into your mailbox, you don't pull out the item, you pull out the parcel itself. All in, it's about 22 touches of labor for each item that you order. What does this mean? This means there are lots of sort of applications within the context of fulfillment centers and DCs and sort hubs that lend themselves to robotic automation. And that's a good thing because we all understand sort of the labor challenges that we're facing. So the applications that have sort of risen to the top, meaning this is you telling us the applications that matter to you most right now, uh, and they are picking, palletizing and depalletizing, and then this whole sort of plethora now that we see of collaborative mobile robots or autonomous mobile robots, AMRs. So uh, plus one sort of focuses on of that entire chain of 22 picks uh, or touches of labor in a couple of different pieces of it. And the first is parcel induction. There are lots of instances within your operations where a parcel has to be fed into some sort of equipment, a sorting machine, you know, bags, uh, et cetera. So this is a typical robot induction system. It's an industrial robot. That industrial robot has a gripper that's sort of engineered for the input stream itself. You'll have bulk flow that then needs to be singulated onto the outbound process. And this is everywhere inside your operations is you have effectively sort of cluttered piles of different varieties that then need to be processed into single flow, whether it's to you know, feed an ASRS, uh, whether it's to uh, be sorted through a scan tunnel, et cetera. So, 
you have sort of this chaos that comes in and then the robot has to pick them one at a time. So a typical induction system is going to have not just the robot but also the 3D vision technology that's used to identify the parcels or the ones that are of interest, drive the robot to them, and then you know, set them out. So once it's singulated onto the outbound conveyor or spur or what have you, uh, there's a second step where you have to validate that you in fact did that correctly. Uh, none of us want missorts downstream. Uh, and missorts come from often double picks. Uh, you can't always avoid a double pick. You might be picking an item and you have a rider that comes with it, what have you, but you better know about it on the outbound side. So once the robot has placed what it believes to be one parcel in the correct orientation, there's in fact a second sensor, another camera that looks at the outbound and says, you know what? I don't see one parcel, I see two. We need to recover that or we need to handle that as an exception, et cetera. The last thing we want to do is send that downstream. It's effectively the warehouse equivalent of zero defects on an automotive line. So an induction system is, not, is going to have the robot, the framework, the safeguarding, uh, and the vision system. Here's an example of that in action. So you see the robot, it's picking from this cluttered pile that is a never-ending stream coming uh, from up, uh, further up on a second mezzanine, and the robot is taking one at a time and placing it on the outbound, and then every once in a while, the system will ask for help from a human being. This is significant because the input stream can be so varied that you will on occasion need the robot, the robot will need human intervention. And we're going to talk more about this notion of human in the loop uh, later. This is a multi-lane induct system because chances are your uh, volume is such that you have multiple lanes on your sortation equipment or your cross belt or whatever it is. Uh, and you'll need to ultimately have manipulators at each one. In this case, we're using uh, hoppers. Those hoppers control the, you know, meter the flow of the parcels. The parcels will be into the pick bowls. The robots use the cameras that you see to find them on an individual basis, wait for a location available on the outbound belt, and that's how you get singulated flow from multiple lanes using robotic picking. But everything that we've talked about so far is robots picking from and on to conveyors of one type or another. But if we've learned anything here at Modex uh, this year is that autonomous mobile robots are increasingly being used in place of or in addition to standard conveyance. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that. The main one being the AMRs are much more flexible in routing. So uh, this is an example of the same robot induct, but instead of going from cluttered pile on a conveyor to a second conveyor, it actually will load multiple AMRs. So the parcels are picked from the top conveyor, exceptions are dropped off on the end, the robot places it onto an AMR on, let's call it the right side of the conveyor, uh, while it's inspecting for the next one on the opposite side of the conveyor. So the robot will pick to A, pick to B, pick to A, pick to B, and the mobile robots will then drive off and route themselves to the locations uh, for the drop. So this is an example of another sort of multi-agent robot picking from bulk onto multi multiple AMRs. So this is a Tompkins T-Bot T system. There's the robot. It's using the vision system to identify the packages. That twitch that you see is in fact to scan the barcodes. Once it scans the barcodes, it will place the parcels onto the robots, pass the barcode information to the specific AMR, and then that AMR knows which sort drop location those 
parcels ultimately need to go to. So that's what you're seeing here. The, it'll pick, scan, place, and the robots will drive off. Parcel induction onto conveyors, parcel induction onto AMRs, ultimately with the result being faster throughput, more flexible uh, in your operations. But we have already established that in the DC and in the warehouse, you've got lots of different kinds of cluttered piles, if you will. And one of them is just mixed pallets. We have tons of mixed pallets that need to be broken down, and those, parcel, those packages need to come off those pallets and inducted into your, you know, received into inventory, et cetera. Well, that's just another example of 3D vision being applied to a robot that's using a gripper of some kind or another. So this is mixed depalletizing. If it's, you know, standard homogenous pallets, or if it's a rainbow pallet where each layer might be different, but a given layer is the same, then, you know, 3D vision technology isn't gonna add much value. But you're increasingly shipping mixed skew pallets where even on an individual layer, you'll have multiple different skews. That's when 3D vision becomes important. Uh, clearly, if your job as an associate in the DC is to de-stack pallets, your work shift is measured in tons, not hours. It's not good work, and we know that uh, it's prone to repetitive stress injuries, et cetera. So robots are a good way to, to manage that. So you, we're gonna re reduce worker load. You, know, you, you need to get to a continuous, consistent rate of about 600 cases per hour to make this uh, ROI work. Uh, but this is easily deployed, right? There's no risk, it's a standard system fully integrated with the robot and the vision and the safety. Uh, you know, this particular robot and gripper can handle about a 50 pound uh, sack or parcel or, you know, tray. So this is what this looks like in action. The robot is picking from the pallet, whether it's bags or trays, incoming view, there's a camera above and they get sorted onto the downstream conveyor where ultimately they'll be decanted uh, or that's a cross dock and they'll be you know, made into mixed pallets later. Um, for warehouse robots to work, this is the difference between manufacturing robotics and, and warehouse automation is in manufacturing, you're gonna do the same thing a million times and in the warehouse, you're not gonna do the same thing three times in a row. So, the underlying sort of technologies that have to, you know, come to bear are really 3D vision and a human in the loop. We'll talk about the 3D vision piece first. Because of the variability in the process, you have to discover every pick. You saw the parcel induction with all those packages sitting in front of the robot, all askew and asunder. You know, having to determine which one to pick when is a 3D vision problem. So you have to have you know, reliable 3D vision. And that's really what's come to the fore in the last five years in the industry is that you know, cost-effective 3D sensors and software have been made, you know, integrated into industrial robots. The robot arms have been around for 40 years. It's the vision piece that's new, which is what allows these robots to do meaningful work for you in your warehouse. So you have to have 3D vision. The, uh, the other is a human in the loop. Because your process changes so often, uh, it is likely, it's going to happen, that the robot is gonna encounter a scene it just simply doesn't understand. And when that happens, what are you gonna do? Well, you know, you're gonna have a human in the loop. The robot's going to say, hey, I don't know how to process this. Will the human help me? And you do that, uh, you do those two things with two pieces of technology. In our case, pick one is the 3D vision system. That 3D vision system is comprised of, you know, 3D sensors, some uh, specialized lighting, uh, and industrial compute. And then the other is this Yonder, which is a cloud service that connects those robots in your DCs to a human being, in our case, in San Antonio, Texas, where Plus One is based, and on the occasion that the robot needs help, it can get it. So. 
Uh, pick one 3D vision. This is just an image of what the software looks like sort of on the back end. This is nothing that you would have to deal with. But what you need to understand is it uses 3D vision, 2D vision, uh, and AI to sort of discriminate what pick it should go after next. And we have to do that with the fastest response possible. The vision system has some responsibilities. It has to, of course, determine which is the, the next best available pick. And that's a set of rules. Uh, and it's not always sort of the one on top, right? It has to do with which one gets out the fastest, et cetera. Uh, it also has to ensure that the robot isn't going to crash into something else in that pile uh, and in so doing. And then it has to orient that gripper, whatever that gripper might be, to the package such that when you set it out, it is in fact in the correct orientation on the outbound side. Now, in your case, it may not matter what the outbound looks like, right? Maybe you're just dropping it into a sack and orientation doesn't matter. But in a lot of cases, when you're feeding a downstream sorter or something, then it's important that the package be put at a certain angle. To do that, that's what the vision system is responsible for. But the other was this notion of exception handling. You can do exception handling a couple of ways. The robot can say, hey, I don't understand. Can someone come help me? And somebody's going to have to take and walk over to the robot, open the door, you know, pull out whatever the problem package might be, shut the door, go back downstairs, reset the system, etc. That's sort of the sneaker net approach to exception handling. Uh, we argue that it's much better to do that remotely in you know, near real time. And that's what Yonder is, right? So it directs the work of many robots from any location. So Grace is a crew chief on our you know, team, and she's monitoring the performance of robots in the diaspora. She's here in San Antonio, the robots are elsewhere, and she's not connected to those robots all the time. She's off doing other work, but when the robot does not achieve confidence threshold, when it says, I'm not sure what I'm looking at, then it raises a flag over the cloud, and that's when she gets this interface, and intuitively she knows immediately which item the robot should go pick. And you do that very, very quickly. This whole sort of cycle from the robot in the world asking for help to the time it is in fact running again is on the, always under six seconds. So this is an example of Yonder being applied to a depalletizing scenario. So you see it's a mixed skew palette, but that box on top is a disaster, right? So the robot is in fact going to try to pick it itself. That was its own uh, p vision pipeline trying it, but then when it failed, it invoked the human in the loop. The human is now going to say, you know what, I see the problem. I think you should pick it on this side. And they command it from remote, and now the robot will say, okay, if that's where you told me to go, and you see how it did it even at an angle, uh, and then the parcel is successfully handled. There is zero chance a, an AI or an algorithm would have been able to do what you just said. But here's the thing, people are amazing. People are better than robots and vision systems at everything. And it was a person that had said, oh, yeah, I think you should probably pick it on this face and you're going to be successful. So this sort of marriage of robots doing what they can autonomously with a person as a backup is frankly the reason this company's even called Plus One, because through the addition of that one human being, the system becomes that much more reliable, fault tolerant, and just lots of goodness uh, comes out of that. So, uh, you know, working with Plus One, uh, I just want to point you to some resources. First, you know, our website's going to have a lot of sort of product information, case studies, uh, et cetera, that you'll want to familiarize yourself with as you look at your list of tasks and your workflow in uh, your facility. Where are sort of the matches now? Uh, you know, and come to us with your, your challenges. The other is our YouTube channel is... Uh, you know, has lots of content where you can see different applications uh, that might be like yours. And then the other is we, you know, engage with us on LinkedIn. We have a very active community on LinkedIn for Plus One. Uh, and we're all the time sort of sharing 
you know, tips that we found along the way. Uh, you know, you can reach out to us with your automation priorities. The last thing I would say is you can also contact one of our, you know, integration partners. Uh, and, you know, this just gives you a sense of the different partners, some of them, many of them here uh, at Modex uh, that use our technology or can deploy our technology, you know, for your application. Uh, in the world today, Plus One's technology will be responsible for over a million picks today. And we're going to be responsible for a million picks tomorrow. And that just continues to increase over time. Uh, so the robots are capable of supporting your applications. Uh, and I would say this is sort of what it's going to take to con for you to increase your picks in your facility. You're going to have to have really reliable 3D vision. It better be hardware agnostic because the gripper for your shoe boxes is going to be gr different than the gripper for your bag of dog food. Uh, the, you're going to have to have a human in the loop to ensure that the system has an elegant way of dealing with exceptions. And finally, you know, work with people that have been doing this for a really long time. Uh, and with that, you know, I thank you for your interest and uh, look forward to continuing to engage with you. Be well.